Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce this morning's speaker, Lisa Stone, uh, co-founder uh, of Blogger. Uh, in 2005, she started as a quote-unquote labor of love, and uh, as the leading participatory news, entertainment, and information network for women online, the site features more than 50,000 members and has a directory of more than 50,000 blogs and reaches more than 15 million women every month. Uh, prior to launching Blogger, Lisa was the Vice President of Programming, Executive Producer, and Editor-in-Chief of Women.com and was the first internet journalist awarded a Neiman Fellowship by Harvard University. Lisa's experience extends beyond the web. She's written for the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and the Oakland Tribune, just to name a few traditional outlets. But these days, you can find her writings online on her personal blog, Surfette, at surfette.typepad.com. Uh, on Twitter, of course, she's Lisa Stone. And on Blogger, at blogger.com slash blog slash, wait for it, Lisa Stone. Without further delay, that's uh, enough of me, and let's get Lisa Stone up here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Josh. I want to thank John Dube and Susan Murnett, my dear friend, and all of ONA for inviting me here. Josh and I were talking about the fact that this is actually the first ONA I've been able to attend, um, which is ironic as someone who grew up only wanting to do one thing, which is write for newspapers. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the completely accidental path that led me to what I'm working on today. Um, I think that it's important for me to share that the reason, and I'm, I'm working to queue up a, oops, a page here, the reason that BlogHer has become the media network of its size and stature that it is, is because of traditional news values, because of the separation of church and state. And I'm speaking not just for those of us who are working to write for it and develop it every day, I'm talking about the users who are working with us to develop it. Their value on hard news is incredibly important. Um, and I say that because I was just on the phone yesterday with my dear friend Matt Schofield, uh, who is an editor at the Kansas City Star. Some of you may know him. We were Neiman Fellows together, and we were talking about this cataclysmic state of our industry from a business perspective, talking about the future of investigative journalism, talking about the future of watchdog journalism. and. Um, we started talking about this conversation. And he said, well, are you going to tell them what a big accident it is that you ended up online? And I said, well, yeah, I think I need to. Um, in 1997, I left CNN. I had gone to broadcast from the Oakland Tribune when I found out I was pregnant and decided that I needed to get uh, a broadcast credit on my resume um, before I, I started focusing on being a parent. And in 1997, I had a one-year-old baby and a new divorce, and I was grounded. There was no way that I was going to go tripping off internationally to, to become the war correspondent I had always dreamed of becoming. And um, I did a very, very accidentally smart thing. I went to web TV. I spent six months at Web TV as a news and sports producer, uh, where I met Tom Regan, by the way. Uh, who was gung-ho working at the Christian Science Monitor and changing their world. And he said, this is the future, this is fantastic, you've done the right thing. I said, okay, promptly quit web TV and went to women.com, which was a big shock to everyone who knew me as someone who was devoted to hard, hard news. Um, I did it because at the time there was this massive disconnect for me as a new user. Everyone was saying women will never go online and yet, the only life I had, other than work and my son, was online. I couldn't afford the New York Times anymore. I was reading it online. I was all over the Mercury Center, that gorgeous site uh, that was, was quickly taken offline. And at women.com, we began the process of doing what those of us in this room call sourcing. And what I found was that by sourcing with our audience by researching what they were looking at and interested in that we could come up with 
stories, data, and ideas from women online that were basically all about the trajectory of, of human life, hard news and soft, uh, that just was not um, something that that uh, I was seeing uh, in uh, other, other newsrooms um, because it was a new medium. So let me tell you a few things about Blogger, and then I'd like to get back to the value of this particular user in the community that we built. Here you see, by the way, the homepage of blogger.com. This is one of the three areas in which Blogger publishes today. And I'll talk about the accidental starting of this company in a minute. We reach more than 15 million women a month uh, now, and we do three main things. We hold conferences for women who blog. We have a news site at blogger.com where we are the only site I'm aware of covering what women are doing across 24 different topics in social media, particularly blogging. We are the seventh largest blog network trapped by Comscore Media Metrics. Uh, there's WordPress, there's Blogger, there's Federated Media, there's Technorati, there's the Six Apart sites, then there's us, and then there's Gawker. The final thing that we do, and this has become really essential, we have become the publisher for 2,500 different blogs by women and men where we syndicate Fortune 500 advertising to and headlines from blogs that sign our editorial standards. The standards we use on our network are the classic tenets of good journalism, in my opinion. Thou shalt not plagiarize, thou shalt not copyright infringe, thou must source and link uh, the, everything that you use, and one must not Se must not put chocolate in peanut butter. One must separate church and state. Paper post is not invited in our network, never has been. This particular approach is only working because of the value that our users place on it. In the previous slide, I mentioned that we do these conferences for women who blog. In 2005, after coming back from my Neiman Fellowship, Kevin Drum of the Washington Monthly asked, where are the women who blog? And thousands of women bloggers across the internet screamed and beat their fists on their, on their keypad. And I got together with two colleagues who are now my co-founders, Elisa Camelhort page and Dory Desjardins, and said, you know what, I think it's ridiculous to complain about this because we're not beholden to anyone. We now have Jay Rosen's First Amendment machines, right? Why don't we just go off and show everyone where the women who blog are? Let's just have a conference, you know? Why tell when we can show? 305 women came from four different continents and some men as well, notably, importantly, and we were blown away by their interest in helping shine a light on the space. So we said, what do you want? And they said, well, we'd like more conferences, please. We'd also like a news service where we can find out what we're doing. Because even those of us who are totally addicted to RSS can't follow the thousands of blogs that are happening out there. And then finally, we would really like a better business model than Google AdSense. A, we can't stand the green alien ads marching across our, our screens. And secondly, we really need to make more than 25 cents a day. We really think what we're writing is fantastic and we think it's worth publishing. And we said, okay, we can do that. But we can only do it if you sign these guidelines. And unless you sign these guidelines, we cannot publish you. We don't want you on the site and we also don't want you uh, as part of our network. Thus, we became the school marms of the internet. This was in 2006, and it was a really taxing time to be saying to people, you know what, no, you cannot accept uh, that $250 DVD and also put it in your editorial well and be a member of our network. That's inappropriate. You can't take that new car for six months and drive it around. It's not appropriate. And the women in our network said, you're right, we agree. We think that's important. I don't think that I would have had the confidence to pursue the guidelines that you see here today if I hadn't had the experience at women.com where I saw the 
unbelievable appetite women had for hard news, where I saw the incredible value that they placed on every golden word they read in their favorite newspaper and heard from their favorite local radio station or read in their favorite magazine. The embrace of hard news that we see for women online is exceptional. And I think that while we're undergoing a cataclysmic time in the economy of our, of our beloved industry. I think that uh, things you've already heard from other people at this conference about the value users place on what you know to do, to research, to source, to investigate, to, to tell, to report stories in the most transparent and, and um, substantive way possible has never been more important to the community that can help make your ideas a success. And to support that, I wanted to share with you very briefly a couple of slides from a survey that we started to do at BlogHer. Now, we're still running this company like it's three chicks with credit cards who are taking a flyer on our first conference, okay? So when I say that we spent money on a survey, I want you to know that we wrung our hands in 2008 and we only did it because Pew and Forrester had done their most recent surveys of women online in 2006 and they said, nope, we're not gonna update it this year. And we said, you really should. You wouldn't believe the acceleration in use that we're seeing, you've gotta do it. All right, we'll do it. We found, and this is our second annual survey, which we very fortunately had co-sponsored by iVillage, um, that women's use of social media is accelerating dramatically. Of the 79 million online, 53% of them are in social media every week. And I'd like to pick up on some of what I understand Evan said to you yesterday uh, and talk a little bit about what they're doing. Because people ask me all the time, you know, isn't Twitter going to kill blogs? Isn't Twitter going to sort of end it? I mean, doesn't Facebook mean it's over? And we are finding that absolutely not and I'll show you a user quote on why in a few minutes. The bottom line is that Twitter is important, yes, for sharing information, but the most important user we're finding, the most important advocate for people who really care about the best in news information and entertainment is the blogger. Her use of news and information is somewhat shocking in its uh, depth. She's completely gone online. 80% of them are reading every day or two to three times a week. They blog all the time. More than 80% use social networks and more than a third use status updating, which is a um, attempt by the social media sphere to be non-denominational and not say Twitter all the time. Status updating is Twitter. This woman is absolutely the most influential person you're going to meet online. And here's the really good news. Remember back in 2005, I mentioned 305 women came from four continents for this crazy conference idea we had? When we surveyed them after the conference, we said, all right, so you say you want a news service. We're not building a, a pink silo for women anywhere, so tell us. What are you writing? What are you talking about? What do you care about? We gave them an obnoxiously long list of topics. Um, Susan Burnett may remember that list. She took it, Lisa Williams took it. It was like 50 different topics. We found the average respondent checked five different items. Even if she was blogging about parenting or food, she was talking about politics as related to her worldview. Even if she was talking about politics or business or tech, she would occasionally take a foray into the softer side of life, whether it was what she was wearing on her feet or what she was talking about at the water cooler. It was really fascinating and it shored up our commitment to go forth and try to provide all of the community of women who blog, not try to parse them out. So think of it as our permission to do many different section fronts instead of doing some 1894 women's page, right? And what is so important to me about this is that it's incredibly liberating editorially 
it really diversifies the amount of information we can get from users. And what you see here, by the way, are three different pictures. One is, of course, the picture of Laura Lang and Yuna Lee, who were incarcerated in Korea. This was a subject of enormous interest and concern across the women's blogosphere. You see a, a snapshot of Momversations, uh, which is a very interesting program put together by DECA TV, featuring a variety of women who blog about parenting. And then finally, you see Blogger's own exclusive with then presidential candidate Barack Obama in Roseburg, Oregon, uh, an interview that Aaron Kotecki Vest did. Blogger is nonpartisan. We're nonpartisan because our bloggers are omnipartisan, because we're still trying to uphold those fantastic guidelines uh, that you saw, and because we want to make sure that there is an opportunity for every woman to talk about her opinions uh, online in a place where they're done have to be blood running in the aisles. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So let's get back to the importance of Twitter. We see women using Twitter all the time. We predate Twitter and Facebook, and we find that these people are using Twitter and Facebook to talk about BlogHer. And we find that there is just as much discussion um, uh, by um, our users about the silly things as the serious things, but we do see an ongoing level of discomfort with some of their social media tools. And I'm really glad that you all are here. I was looking through the fantastic list of panels at everything from the widgets, like the ones um, we use. We have news apps in the Apple App Store from BlogHer. We're using everything we can get our hands on. And the bottom line is that users really do want long form as well as short form information and storytelling. I absolutely reject the construct that it has to be done in 140 characters or less to sell. However, you may find that your headline writing has to get better and better in order to compete. When we asked why they had a motivation to blog, why they were spending all this time, they shared some very interesting information here. And this kind of goes all the way back to the late 90s and my experience with the women.com message boards. They always say first and foremost that they do it for fun. But all you have to do is look at the remaining list of reasons that women say that they are investing hours and hours writing their own stories, their own anecdotes, their own news and information to see why they're able to take and run with issues like the election or the economy so dramatically. In anticipation of our conversation here today, I went back and looked at some statistics. In 2008, we had, uh, of the 10 most popular stories on blogger.com, seven of the 10 were about the election or about the economy. In addition, I tracked the growth in the number of political blogs by women during the election season. And from the week when Senators Clinton and Obama both announced their candidacies for those presidency, followed closely by um, Senator McCain, we had roughly 600, a little more than 600 political blogs by women listed in our directory of 50,000 blogs. By election day, there were more than 2,600, and we've been able to parse them into a widget uh, in the Apple App Store of political bloggers tracked by state, so that when local reporters were looking for ways to talk about women blogging politics in Texas, they could go find bloggers from the left, right, center, and extremes of all of the above, because we had color-coded them. There's a huge appetite by these bloggers for what their local media were writing, uh, and what, and what they were saying. I want to share with you this slide because it's a painful one for me to look at. But what I'm trying to share with you is that they're shifting mediums, but they're not they're, they're not losing their appetite. Uh, I think that actually many women would tell you uh, that they just don't have the perfect device yet. They don't have the perfect newsreader yet. They don't have the perfect personalized page yet. There is so much change happening in the acceleration of the user. She's not abandoning news. She's abandoning print. And I think that given the number of ideas that I see happening in this community every day, that we should really take heart from that, as painful as I know it is. Um, 
I think this is why when I was speaking earlier this week with my friend Michael Scholar about some of the business case studies he's doing as part of his fellowship and I, I described what's happening to, to all of us as a contraction, he was like, contraction? Contraction? Come on. That's, don't you think that's slightly a tame word? And I was like, well, you're right. But I say contraction because the appetite is so enormous for what's happening. The second a major news story is broken by one of the big 20 papers, it is sent across my, stream, my screen either in IM or in Twitter or in email by some blogger I know. And the, there is an enormous amount of support that we can get from these people because their use is accelerating. The one thing I want to point out about this slide is that when we started doing this survey in 2008, you can see we said, how many of you were spending less time doing these things? And please note the oxymoronic traditional website question that we asked. You see 2008 versus 2009? 2009 is where the Women in Bloggers Network were in 2008. And where the blog her network is this year is where this general population is going. The good news is that these bloggers, I think, can be your best advocates for the news you tell, the stories you break, the ideas that you have. What we found, and we of course as a for-profit media network have been asking them zillions of things for advertisers about, as well as about content, um, but I want to focus on this last piece of data on this page where we say that 85% of the women in our network say they bought a product on a blogger recommendation. They do the same thing with the stories that they share and the news that they share. Getting involved with the women blogging and your topic of interest and expertise can support what you're doing massively. There are an enormous number of organizations since 2005 who have made the most of these initiatives. This is my last slide and I wanted to show you what a difference five years has made. We've gone from where are the women bloggers to all these organizations started by women to celebrate the, the writing in their area of expertise. Everything from Blogging Wild Brown and Blogalicious to Blistem to She Writes to the Food Blog Search. Splitsville is a site devoted to people who are getting a divorce. Uh, women 2.0 is devoted to women who are starting their own entrepreneurial enterprises. There is only one organization that predates Blogger on this list and of course those of you in the know recognize Web Girls International, which is thriving today and a very worthy and important organization. So I just bring you back to the homepage of Blog Her to say that I really never anticipated as someone who started reading the New York Times in my hometown of Missoula, Montana when my dad would bring home the three-day-old paper fresh off the plane. I never expected to be the CEO of a venture-backed media company that is quite likely to be profitable next year and is competing head-to-head -head for Fortune 500 dollars with the largest women's publishing companies in the world. What we know what we've learned as journalists has translated beautifully into this space and I'm really excited to see what each of you accomplish. If you have any questions or anything you want to discuss I'd love to start questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, we are on the uh, audio. Audio autocracy. Hi, I'm Ken Chavez from the Sacramento Bee. How are you? Good. Um, you talked a lot about your community guidelines and the ethics that you transported, translated over from journalism. So how do you police yeah. the activity of the members that you've um, allowed into the network? Thank you for asking the question. Um, is uh, how do we police the adherence to the community guidelines that we have in our network? Um, constantly and uh, diligently and with the help of our users. I'm going to go back to that page. Um, 
because these are so important. Um, we have three things that we do for the people in our network. Here we go, and I'm probably going to go past it, sorry. Um, there we go. So um, we, do th we do three things. Uh, when people come to blogher.com and sign up to be members of our new site, they are shown the community guidelines and asked to adhere to them. We built blogher.com in Drupal back in 2006 in January when we launched because it was free. We have since benefited from working with Drupal because they have a very adept mark as spam, uh, report as spam function. And we have a community manager whose first business of every day with her assistant is to go through and look at that uh, information. We ignore the spam bots from overseas first and go after the people who are abusing our community very first. Um, I think that I want to get into some of the most important forms of abuse in a second, but now I'll quickly talk about how we do it on the network. We have 2,500 blogs in our network, and we have between 7 and 10 headline editors, each of whom police between 250 and 300 blogs. And I use that word police with a small p. I want to point out that I've never believed in, and I know my co-founders, Elisa Camelhart Page and Jory agree, Jory Desjardins agree, that we don't believe in a universal standard for the internet. That doesn't work for me as someone who's, for whom the First Amendment is a religious you know, issue. But we do believe it's really important that if you come to our member blogs or you come to our site that you treat each other with the courtesy that we demand. And that means that you can hate the idea, but we don't believe in hate speech or harassment against the person. And if you say something that is racist or hateful, you're gone. You've exercised your First Amendment rights and we've shown you the door. That's fine. On the 2,500 blogs who join our network, when they come and sign up, we ask them to sign our editorial guidelines, preferably in blood, and they have to fax them in. They literally fax them into the office. It's like a hard-coded thing that they do. We have their signature. And then we find that when we come to them and say, you know, there's an ad for a little blue pill on your banana cream pie recipe, or we say, you know, there's a, a, a pro-Nazi nut job, over here on your, on your story about um, Una Lee and, and Laura Ling, we got a problem. We find that they're, oh yeah, missed that, sorry, we'll fix it. Our headline editors do a lot of that. By far the most important thing that we used to police was hate speech. Um, I have found that, and I again learned this at women.com, if you make it unsafe for women to say, I support John McCain and here's why, or if you make it unsafe for them to say, I support Nancy Pelosi and here's why, you will never be able to grow a community that's going to read the kinds of in-depth news and reporting that we want to do. Coming forward, the much bigger issue has been the issue of um, spam has been the issue of people trying to embed commercial messages in editorial content. And so that's the new forefront. Sorry for the long-winded answer. Okay. Hi, Lee. Hi, Lisa. My name is Michelle Rafter. I'm a Hi. technology and business reporter and a blogger. Nice um, to meet you. And as an entrepreneur, I have an entrepreneurial question. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us um, some details of the kind of revenue that your network of 2,500 bloggers are generating, possibly for other people in the room who are thinking sure. along the lines of, of going on their own. Sure, absolutely. So we're a privately held venture-backed company, so there are some things I can share and some things that I can't. Um, for the individual blogger, the way we pay our bloggers is through a revenue share. Uh, here's how it works. We take 10% for every advertising dollar on the network, Blogger takes 10% off the top for the cost of administering the network, and we split the remainder, uh, the remaining 90 cents, 50-50 with the blogger. The bloggers earn revenue based upon a cost per thousand views basis or a CPM basis. So if a blogger has a thousand viewers and we have our $10 CPM, which is actually slightly lower than our average, the blogger will get $4.50. 
if she has a typical arrangement with us. I should say she or he because we have fantastic guys blogging in our network, some of the funniest dads and best male chefs writing on the internet. Um, the smallest check that we will cut for revenue share is $25. Uh, there are some bloggers who are quite small in our network. We've always said we don't care about quantity, we want quality, we want the best writing. Because we've learned that a, a blogger who's excellent, who's committed to growing her audience, can really do that over a period of time. And some people go supernova. Uh, uh, and. We do have bloggers in the network uh, who are earning five-figure a month incomes and living off this. So we have run the full gamut. I hope that answers your question. OK, thank you. Yes, we have two questions. Have used to grow their so, um, Sean Eccles from Computer World. Sir, excuse me. I'm going to make an error on that. <laughs> I'm not going to pronounce your name right. You might want to say it into the microphone. But the question is, what techniques are bloggers using to raise their profiles? Um, it takes time. It takes effort. Uh, there are a number of sessions that I know you all have had here this week and about how to do that. The bottom line is that. Um, if you build it, they will not necessarily come. The goal is to fall in love with the subject area, write expert, fantastic content, and then go discuss it with other people. You need a community. It really does take a village to build a blog following or a network following. And I think that the thing to do when you go out and try to grow the profile of what you're doing, you need to have substantive conversations with the users you're trying to reach. Because everything you do is a reflection of the brand that you're building on your personal blog. So go fish where your fish are. If you're writing about the Supreme Court, you should be off commenting on the SCOTUS blog, right? Or on Howard Bashman's appellate blog. If you are writing about how to take fantastic photographs of your children, you should be off on the Pioneer Woman or you should be over on Notes from the Trenches. You also, I think, need to very much consider joining a network. Uh, one like ours is a great option if they're open. Uh, I also think that building coalitions with local media in your area is a great way. I mean, there's no reason you shouldn't contact local newspaper, local radio, local you name it, and ask how the two groups can work together. Coalition building is everything in this space. That's a rather general answer. I do think that anyone who goes onto blogger.com and searches on Elise Bauer, how to grow traffic to your blog, and reads her five part essay uh, uh, seminar will benefit enormously. It is the best thing on the internet. And she's the largest food blogger in the world, so she knows what she's talking about. There were other questions? Hey, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. I've, I've met a lot of people here today who say, I'm thinking about doing my own startup. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to figure out whether to make the leap or not. Could you share a little bit about your decision-making process of, you know, yes, I'll do it or no, I won't? I will. I think actually anyone who's thinking about doing a startup should talk to Lisa Williams of Place Blogger. Um, uh, she is an expert and is hiring full-time equivalents. Um, we didn't want startup funding. Uh, we didn't want venture funding. I didn't want it. Uh, Blogger is the fourth startup I've worked with, uh, Web TV being the first. It is the first one I've co-founded. Um, I had seen in the past that it was very difficult for people who were talking about media to think about the value of building the community first. I'm going to criticize the grandfathers of our industry now, so bear with me. The classic model in which I feel I was raised as a journalist, and you may have had a different experience, is you put out something gorgeous, some beautifully produced story, report, project, and then you wrap the user around it. You tell the user why it's valuable. That is fundamentally not working in this space. What we wanted to do was to build the community first and then see, we didn't even know this was going to be a business, let's be clear. When they came to us and said, yeah, 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 we want these three things, conferences, news service, and publishing network, we said, okay, but community first, guidelines first, so that we can all trust each other, believe each other's writing, and value it, and then wrap 
business models around this. We're going to try a bunch of things. We're going to put spaghetti on the wall. So to Lisa's question, we made the decision in 2006 to launch the site. We launched our fledgling network of 34 parenting blogs in May of that year. And we did start with parenting blogs because that's what the consumer packaged goods uh, produced by Fortune 500 companies wanted to sponsor. We immediately sold out. We decided to launch a new site, bloggerads.com. Meanwhile, Elisa, Jory, and I are working 120 hours a week. We are consulting. We are eating ramen. We, we are losing our minds. By the end of the year, we have uh, about 180 blogs in the network, and three really important, valuable sponsors came to us. Dove, General Motors, and, and a third one, I think it may have been Kraft, and said, we absolutely love you. We love everything you're doing. We think it's brilliant, and you need to be 10 times bigger. And we were like, oh god. <laughs> How can we be bigger? We're, we're dying here. So um, we spoke to some really good friends of ours, including Ann Winblad at Hummer Winblad and a couple of other people, and they said, you really should consider venture funding. And so we read everything we could think of, uh, went out, and um, got a Series A round from Venrock. Um, and they cared very much about uh, the community first. So that's how we got started. It was terrifying. Terrifying. Um, and I think ultimately it was really important for us to find the right people. I think it helped enormously that the space was really heating up um, with people um, like Federated Media uh, who do such a good job. I think I see Neil in the audience. Um, I think I also see Michelle Canigal from the Oakland Tribune, my old seatmate who watched me try not to throw up into Ben Charney's uh, when I was pregnant, try not to throw up into Ben Charney's wastebasket every day uh, because I, she was the only one who knew. Um, so that was, that was a big deal. Um, I think if you're going to go out for venture funding, you should consider attending the, the Women 2.0 uh, sessions. Uh, I think you should also consider reading um, Fred Wilson's Venture Beat. And I think you should um, Try to reach out and, and follow paid content as often as you possibly can. They're doing excellent reporting. Stacy Kramer's here. Try to buttonhole her. One more question. Yes, ma'am. Heather Starr from Pittsburgh Mom. Oh, here you go. Um, I just wondered what your sort of hopes or goals are for the future, either with Blogger or with anything else you have going on. Thank you. Um, our goals for the future are to be profitable. We're well on our way. Um, and I'm very excited because today BlogHer is a rare initiative. We pay the 79 contributing editors we have on blogher.com $50 a post. We pay a very fair and even-handed revenue share to the bloggers in our network uh, without scraping or stealing their content. We are completely convinced that the initiatives we've done to cover the 2008 election and now health care policy with OpenCongress.org and the Sunlight Foundation are the wave of the future. We believe that women in our network care as much about watchdog journalism as they do about trading their stories about the latest movies, Manolo Blahniks, lipstick, and all that other good stuff. Our goal is to stay on the entrepreneurial edge of publishing and to work with our users to listen as hard as we can to where they want to go with the tools that they have. We are leading through listening, not by telling, and that is the reason that we've been able to succeed so far. Um, I think ultimately, I think a lot about what 10 guys or gals are building somewhere in a garage more than I think about um, what's already out there. In the, in the purview, but I think you'll see us move into other forms of media, radio, video, um, and uh, we already have one book, uh, Bloggers Sleep is for the Week. It's a, a parenting blog book, so we're, we're very happy about that. Thank you for asking. That's it. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you.